Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And for some of you, welcome. For others of you, welcome back to the 7th International Cambridge Conference on Evidence-Based Policing. It's my great honor to uh, introduce our first guest this morning, who is no stranger to higher education. Uh, he not only went to Oxford University at the age of 28 to uh, take a law degree, um, but uh, continued his education at the University of Sheffield with a master's in business administration and uh, also uh, was part of the uh, uh, course at the Institute of Criminology uh, for the Brams Hill students in the senior command course uh, under the title of Applied Criminology and Police Management. Uh, he's the former Chief Constable of Merseyside. He's been one of Her Majesty's Inspectors of Constabulary um, and is well known to you all as uh, the Police Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Service. Please welcome Sir Bernard hogan -Happ. Right, good morning everybody and uh, Larry, thanks for the introduction. It's after an introduction like that you think that, uh, is he good at nothing? Is it is there anything that he's any good at? After a long list of what you might have had a go at. Um, it also makes you feel a bit old, actually, which uh, I'm going to try my best to uh, challenge that notion today. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, great audience, great location, uh, great institution of learning. Um, so what I'm going to do is to, uh, probably it's not going to be the most academic treaty that you're going to hear, but I hope from a pragmatist and a, an operational perspective, I'll leave enough hooks for interest, and perhaps for uh, academics who might be thinking, well, actually, that's an interesting thought. What might we do more of? Um, we're doing quite well, I think, in London and in the Met. Uh, we had, a, and usually from News International, we had quite a good Times editorial yesterday saying that some of the things we're doing uh, are working. I think that's the first time in about five years that we've seen anything positive in News International. I can't think why. Um, but there's an awful lot that's happening in London, which is a fantastic city, changing at pace and something that I'll refer to shortly. Um, Larry's been kind enough to invite me to talk about the, uh, the Met. Uh, and I want to say that, first of all, I don't want to claim that the Met's got the monopoly on any good ideas. Um, we're eager to learn from colleagues, and we're eager to learn from anybody uh, who has good ideas, provided, as you know, in terms of uh, integrity, we attribute those ideas. So the main thing is it's our job to cut crime and catch offenders and help victims. That simple motive uh, has stuck with us ever since Peel uh, was around and is something that remains uh, our guiding principle even now. But I do want to share with you some of the new ideas we're trying in London to achieve these aims uh, and in the ever more complex landscape of policing a major metropolitan city. Uh, London is growing at pace. Uh, we've now seen a million people arrive over the last 11 years. 25% of the population growth has arrived in London. And by no means is London account for 25% of the population of the United Kingdom. So London is perceived as a safe environment in which to grow, uh, either by business or by people who want to bring the children here and make sure that they're kept safe. We do have challenges, and in that, uh, in that environment, it's vital that we innovate and it's vital that we do have new ideas, because if we carry on doing these things the same way we always have, we will not succeed. Um, we already have, on top of the complex environment that is London, we have to find savings, as the rest of the public sector, in our case, about £600 million. Uh, we are doing that. We are uh, cutting our estate by a third and taking the half a billion capital we're receiving and investing the two-thirds of the estate that we are keeping. We are losing 3,500 of our police staff. Uh, we're also reducing the number of managers, so that instead of being the most managed service in the country, we will be the median of the 43 forces. What that allows us to do is to keep 32,000 cops. So despite the fact that there's been a 15% reduction in grants, we will find those savings and invest in the front line, not just to worship the police officer numbers, because that's the business we're in. The police officers are the people who do the job, uh, supported by their police staff colleagues. But we have to have that core element, particularly in London, where we need vast reserves of uh, officers from time to time, to deal with protests and many of the other things where from time to time we put thousands of officers into some of the major demands that we have. If you recognise any of the ideas today as your own, please don't heckle too early. We can discuss it later. But it is, uh, it is important, I think, to attribute when, where uh, that's appropriate. So not all the ideas will be entirely new, but they will be new to the policing of London. And I'd just like to talk a little about those now. Um, the Met is a huge organisation. We have about 96 units. We have nearly 50,000 people uh, and we're spread right across London. 
Uh, we have two thirds of our resources in territorial policing in the 32 boroughs, which are 32 basic command units. Um, and what that means is that we, uh, we have to manage a complex environment through managers in a way that uh, is quite difficult just to communicate with those managers. Last week we had about a thousand of our managers together uh, just to share with them what we're doing and what we're about to do next. We do that every year. In the preceding three weeks we had the 8,000 uh, sergeants and inspectors together in groups of 500 to do a similar thing and to share with them some of our ideas. And the groups of things that I want to talk to you about today are partly about our people, partly about how we use technology, partly about our operational challenges and partly how we professionalise our staff and make sure that what we're doing is going to be good in the future. It'll take around 20 to 30 minutes, uh, and if I'm going over, I'm sure Larry will start to twitch. And if not, the rest of you will, so I will notice. Uh, and I know it's quite warm in here, particularly I suspect at the back, so I'll do my best to, uh, to keep it as lively as possible. The Met is well placed to experiment with new policing because the force in many ways was an experiment itself, of course. In 1822, Sir Robert Peel was appointed as Home Secretary, and while social historians are divided on exact crime levels at the time, there is a poem from that period that perhaps gives us a taste of the feelings on the street. So I'll read you just an extract, and it's from Ways of the Town. It says, Prepare for death if here at night you roam, and sign your will before you step off for home. So I suspect that people weren't too feeling too safe as they wandered around the streets of London. It's hard to imagine the fear of crime and lack of public confidence being expressed, I think, more clearly. London was, historians agree, a dangerous place to be. What little, place there was, what little policing there was in the form of unpaid parish constables and watchmen was widely seen as inefficient and, at its worst, openly corrupt. When he came to office, Peel set to work at once by setting up and chairing a select committee to review London's policing arrangements. Peel's innovation, so familiar to us now, yet so radical and controversial at the time, was to standardise policing into a paid profession, organised in a civilian fashion and answerable to the public. That idea was initially rejected by the committee, but Peel, as great innovators always will, persisted. He succeeded in ensuring his new idea reached the statute book, the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829. That gave authorisation to establish a single service covering an area of then just seven square miles, which then grew into the organisation we, we know today. London now is about four times the size of Paris and four times the size of Rome. By any standards, a huge international city. And at the same time, Peel was reforming the criminal law by drastically reducing the number of crimes for which you could receive the death penalty. Uh, Peel led change which saw the number of capital crimes on the statute book fall by two-thirds, believing that it was prevention through professional policing that would cut crime rather than the spectacle of a man being hung for theft. He was right. Peel's new police was an outstanding success. As London's population grew by a fifth every decade, crime still fell dramatically. A forward thinker indeed, and in the Met, I'm committed to the tradition of change and innovation that created the service that I lead today. One of the things I wanted to talk about was in terms of our people and recruitment and development. Peel's most often quoted principle is that the police are the public and the public are the police. Perhaps the first policing innovation then should be to look at exactly what this means in today's world and rethink who we are and how we structure our police service. Robert Peel's re police recruits had to be male, under 35, in good health, strong and at least 5 feet 7 inches tall. Typically at that time they were from a military background. And that persisted for an awful long time. There is a need, however, for change. And of course, over time, it has changed, but it's taken many years of incremental progress. Equal opportunities for female officers were achieved at a shamefully slow pace, and the first uh, BME officer did not join the Met until 1967. Londoners today need a highly skilled, trained, motivated, and professional workforce that understands and reflects the people it serves. The Metropolitan Police Service needs to look and feel like London in order to meet its needs and maintain its trust. As London grows and changes, the dynamics and demographics of the city do develop. We cannot just do things as we've always done and hope that we will keep pace. If we do not adapt, we will be left behind. At the moment, we employ, as I say, around 50,000 people. We have good representation in three groups of those people. We have, uh, in terms of our police staff, about one in four are from minorities. In terms of our PCSOs, Police Crime Community Support Officers, one in three are from minorities. In terms of our special constable, one in four. In terms of police officers, it's nearly 12%. That's increased drastically over the last 10 years, but it remains true that that is a significant underrepresentation compared to the minorities within London. The first three groups out of the four essentially are Londoners. 
but we recruit police officers from all over the country. That's not a defensive state, this statement, just a, an accurate statement of fact. We're in the middle of recruiting about 5,000 police officers. 40% we are taking from London. Of that 40%, 30%, one in three, are minorities. So we can attract good, able minority candidates. But two-thirds are from outside London, where the representation is nearer to 10%. So that impact is a massive one that we are having to consider in our strategies as we go forward. And I need a workforce where 40% of officers we recruit are from BME backgrounds and a majority from London. But in real terms, how will we do this? First and foremost, we cannot do things because that's the way we've always done them. We need to be decisive and we need to be bold. This year we are starting with the London res Residency Criteria. For those in the audience who worked in the Met in the past, that has been available before. It's been defeated at times by people developing postal codes within the London area. But we are going to give it a go from August. The legal advice on whether we can do that is equivocal. But what it doesn't say is that it's illegal. Because for a public servant to actually act contrary to legal advice that says that something is illegal is of course immediately a risk. But where it says it's equivocal, we are prepared to take that risk. And in order to recruit constables with a true understanding of the city they serve, that we will no longer offer new recruits travel concessions from outside London. When I was in charge of recruitment in the Met between 2001 and 4, we recruited 10,000 officers in three years. One of the ways that we incentivised that was a 70-mile free travel pass. When it was first introduced, uh, it was free. It was given by ATOC and the train operating companies. By the time uh, 10 years had passed, it was costing the organisation £26 million a year. We couldn't afford that anyway. But the principal reason we're removing the free rail travel, which was intended to help people to live where they could afford to buy property, is that we intend to incentivise people to live in London, and the free rail travel incentivise the exact opposite. So for that reason alone, we think it's important that we change that particular uh, offer. And the introduction of a residence cri residency criteria, we believe, will make a significant impact. Although it could cause a challenge in terms of the number of recruits, we're aware of that. But I prefer the risk of failing to hit a a target number than I do of having a lack of representation for the next 20 or 30 years. In terms of minority candidates, we've commissioned research to understand the drivers behind decisions within minority communities on whether a career in policing is for them, uh, and we are developing our marketing campaigns accordingly. A new ambassador scheme is underway to be proactive in encouraging minority communities to consider a policing career, and we are engaged with the College of Policing to seek a fundamental review or whether the national entry system and assessment processes properly reflect the needs of a policing London in terms of uh, what we need, which is broadly 50-50. I believe that one assertive and definite step we should take in ensuring that the police reflect the public is a policy which indeed a change of legislation is needed to allow us to recruit one BME officer for every white officer that joins us. This is something that has been tried in Northern Ireland in the, in the uh, following up from 1960s and 70s and the troubles that were there. The Patton Report actually uh, changed the law and uh, said that only a member of the unionist community could be recruited once a member of the Republican community had been selected. People regard this as positive discrimination and in one sense of course it is. But people often misunderstand what that legislation insisted on. It had the same standard for both communities. You went into the pool depending on ability but you come out of the pool depending on representation. So people going into the pool are all of equal uh, standing but they only come out of the pool proportionate to their representation in society. And that worked in Northern Ireland. And for me to get a drastic and rapid change in London, we need to consider a similar approach. But we do need a change in legislation to do that, and I know that is risky for all those involved. But I think it's equally fair to put back to the politicians the challenge of, well, if we want to make radical change in our lifetime, then what could we do differently uh, in the present? I'm just a bit concerned with people who stood at the back, and I've stood in those positions before, so I can see John and I don't know the rest. There are some seats at the front if people would like to sit down. If they'd like to run away at this stage, I don't mind. <laughs> but I don't want you to stand there uncomfortable, that's all. So if anybody would like to, I, I won't be offended by them walking to the front. So we are having a, a run, fundamental look at the way that we recruit and the way that the law may help us to do that. It's not without opposing views. Uh, we do need to have a statutory change to make it happen, but I think it's entirely possible, and I think the political will is there to encourage radical ideas. We have direct entry. There's a great deal of diverse talent, ability, and skill within the service, but I think we need to do more to attract the brightest and the best to join us. The culture of the Met, and indeed in the police service, in the police service around the world, is that you join as a constable. Serve your time, 
prove your worth and work your way through the ranks, um, perhaps right to the very top. It's what I did. It's what many of you have done. Um, but I don't think we can just continue with this approach because it's the way it's always been done. I think we have to consider new, new opportunities. And plans are now well advanced to introduce the first national direct entry scheme at superintendent level, led by the College of Policing. And this autumn, the Met will lead the way in terms of getting 10, up to 10 superintendents in from that scheme, about half of the ones that are taken nationally. To hear that said out loud, for some, it remains quite a shock, because they thought that direct entry would never happen. You thought it was an academic idea that would never get off the ground. These superintendents have never walked the beat. They've never been a custody sergeant. They've never investigated a crime. But I believe they will have proven leadership skills, strong character, and a new perspective with fresh ideas, and will be committed to leading for London. And I can say that because I'll be interviewing them. So I get directly involved in selecting the people because there are risks, there's no doubt. But the risk of standing still is profound too. And I think that many of the disasters we've had in policing have been led by people similar to myself, who for 20 or 30 years have been carrying out policing, and mistakes still happen. So I don't think that of itself is a good enough argument against change. And I think we're as likely to get great talent as we are to get great problems. The superintendents, this group that we, uh, we're talking about, who will they be? Well, we know already that some of them are head or deputy head teachers, barristers, uh, lieutenant colonels in the military, chief probation officers, senior managers from charities or the corporate world. We've attracted in the Met just over 650 people uh, and we are working our way through to the, uh, the short list of who we will interview and who we will take. Uh, I can tell you that of that group, 25% uh, are from a black and minority ethnic background. Sadly, only a quarter or 27% are female. And I don't quite understand that. But at least we have got better representation in terms of minorities, and now we have to see who we will take. But that, for me, is also was one of the benefits, is that at a leadership level, we should get an injection of pace in terms of our ability, but also in terms, I believe, of representation. So following an intensive training period, these superintendents will be fully deployed in London by April of 2016, so around 18 months. And I look forward to working with them. And I think that uh, we will learn lessons in the training of them, and the lessons that we learn in the training of this group of people will apply to the people who arrived and stayed with us for 16 years. I guarantee that the lessons we have to put together for that group, the new group, will transfer to the older, more traditional group, because we will not have thought our, our processes through in the way that probably we have to for this group in particular. Uh, graduate entry and fast track, alongside them will be a cohort of graduate entry officers. Met has recently completed two specific graduate recruitment campaigns aligned to the National Fast Track PC to Inspector program. Uh, in the first group, I've met both groups now who we've taken. First group, we had 3,000 applicants at a rate of a uh, grade of 2 1 or above, and we took around 114. Um, we've just taken another cohort of about 110. So, in just over 12 months, 250 people part of the 5,000, who will be an injection of academic talent, not the only measure of ability, but not a bad one in terms of checking out whether or not these people are going to be good leaders for the future. The top performing 50 graduates will now proceed to the National Assessment Centre this month, and the top 25 will be selected for a fast track scheme, which aims to progress them from constable to inspector in three years. Almost half are female, and over a quarter are from a black or minority ethnic background. These are not the only innovations into how the police officers see their own careers, but also how I think the public see them. And do they see us as innovators, or do they see us as people who follow tradition? We're now going to put in place a scheme from September of Police First. This is meant to mimic in the UK something that, which is Teach First. So Teach First is an opportunity for uh, graduates who may not, be think, may not be sure about a career in teaching, who have a two-year contract, enter teaching, see whether it works for them and their employer, and they may stay, but may not. And if they leave, then there is no bad feeling on either side. Uh, we're starting a police first scheme along similar lines. We know in Teach First, two thirds of the people who joined teaching stayed. And these people have great ability who may not otherwise have thought of teaching. We want to see a similar approach for policing, and we intend to take about 115 people this year, which I think will be a great help. And we'll see exactly how it, uh, it pans out. It'll be launched at a central uh, London event uh, in September of this year, and so we intend to take the first cohort next year because this is the group of graduates are leaving, undergraduates, think about leaving in next year's finals. So we need to get our investment in the milk round now. They also will undergo a, high, in, undergo a highly intensive training programme which will be to a gold standard in police training and will be deployed operationally in autumn of next year. So we're about 15 months away from that group of people 
starting and making a difference in the future for the Met. The participants will develop their leadership skills in the toughest of environments, with the public and with an organisation which is facing challenges every day, policing one of the great cities uh, of the world. The market leader in graduate careers research has reported that 61% of final year students surveyed said that police now could make them more likely to consider a policing career. So as an idea, it seems to have attracted quite a bit of interest, and now we'll have to wait and see the quality of people that are delivered. And that interest is maintained across the demographic groups for BME final year students, where that figure is 66%. So BME graduates are more likely, by a small minority, um, to actually be interested in this scheme. And graduates are telling us that leadership experience, employability and a desire for a challenge are the key drivers behind this. So I think they're going to be interesting days as we look forward. What we know is that many children dream of being a police officer, but not everybody follows through. So hopefully this will capture a few of those people who that, had that uh, thought and that dream. I want to talk now just for a little about technology. Uh, we've come a long way from the trench and rattle and having to use a blue telephone box to call for help. I'm sure there's nobody in the audience who remembers that. Even I don't remember that. And under our Total Policing Technology Initiative, we have broad plans that will enable us to stop crime, arrest offenders and help victims more effectively. We'll always be a people business, but I think a professional army of people uh, equipped with great technology will make them far more effective and far smarter. You remember earlier I said that we are losing £600 million of revenue but we are gaining half a billion of capital. And we will invest that capital in two things. I've said two-thirds of the estate we keep and the, one, the IT that uh, we need to invest in. And that will be well over £200 million in the coming years. Now, I think that mobile technology will allow our officers to take crime reports, secure evidence and send advice directly to victims, which will mean we can achieve far more during our initial contact, keep them out on the street and stop them coming back to the police station because that's the place that we need them to be to provide the service to the people of London. We're uh, piloting at the moment five to 600 uh, iPad minis to be carried by operational staff. The full rollout of 15,000 will, will have happened by the end of the next 12 months. This will allow us to do all the things we need to do, particularly for our uniform officers, but not only our uniform officers. And I think once we have the iPads in the hands of the officers, we'll see great innovation. But without it, it's almost impossible we're still writing on a piece of paper, and that can't be good enough. So it's essential we get that technology out there, start to use apps, start to use the technology to help us do our job in a way that, frankly, the rest of society has already uh, gathered. Uh, we're rolling out body-worn video. That is not new, nor the, the first time that has happened, but nobody's done it at this scale. We've already rolled out 400. These are cameras that are smaller than a mobile phone, made of more robust material, and fit to a shirt or body armour to record video and audio for up to eight to ten hours. It's not a gimmick. It is a very useful piece of kit, and within the next year we'll roll out 16,000 of these pieces of kit. For me, it's a profound change for, change for policing. The big changes in terms of integrity for the police happened in this country probably 30 to well, 30 odd years ago. And the changes were that lawyers were allowed into uh, interviews, CCTV was put into uh, detention areas and police interviews were tape recorded. The area that remains unregarded is the interaction on the street. And what I think that this video uh, will do is actually to provide monitoring of that interaction in a positive way. How helpful it would have been in the shooting of Mark Duggan, now three years ago, to have had an account by a video of what happened because we spent over two years for waiting for the account from a, an inquest that eventually resolve some of the issues involved. So for me, this could be a great step forward. The cameras aren't on permanently. We had a debate about that, uh, but that's so that the public can still speak to us without fear of being recorded, but can be switched on to record incidents and interactions where there is a value in doing so. But essentially, if officers have been deployed to incidents or involved in stop search, they will be used. We run the risk, of course, that an officer forgets or sometimes maliciously f doesn't turn the recorder on. We realise that. But certainly for me, I wouldn't like to see for police officers repeat offending in this area. It's something that I expect that we, uh, as part of the professional behaviour, is to turn that camera on and to record the event. And certainly our first cameras that have been rolled out are showing that officers are eager to get them. In the police stations where some have and some haven't got them, the officers who don't have them want them. And so I think what it's going to show is that officers are doing a good job and it captures some of the dilemmas and complexity of what they deal with rather than necessarily captures bad behaviour. But if that should be the case, then we should be finding it. 
It's vitally important that we do discover bad behaviour and we make sure we remove it or prevent it in the future. It's been rolled out now to eight other boroughs and say within a year the whole organisation on the front line will get it. The officers who are patrolling say that it secures best evidence at live and sometimes chaotic scenes. Now, certainly some of the most powerful evidence has been gathered at domestic violence scenes where in fact it captures this emotion of the moment as well as the physical reality of the violence. And for me, it's a really powerful change for the future. It does show our officers dealing with difficult and dangerous situations, and it allows that evidence to be brought into court in a way that a written statement never can, nor even an oral account by a witness will ever capture the fully the account of what happened at the scene. And I think it has to be in our best interests and the interests of the public. We are using predictive crime mapping technology. This is not something that started here. This is something that started in America. We recognise that. Uh, but the MECT is working with a global technology services company in exploring a new technological initiative that aims to assist us in tackling particularly gang crime through predict predictive and analytic software based on historical and current MET data. It's anticipated that this software may map gang locations, presence, membership and activity based on historical trends and augmented by police knowledge and their local intelligence networks. The aim of the pilot is to build a predictive analytics model which identifies where and when crime is likely to happen. The model is currently being retrospectively tested against a huge historical real data set and will soon learn whether the model has benefits in informing us where and how we deploy our resources in protecting the public, particularly against gangs. For example, we may be able to yield disruption opportunities and target partner interventions more effectively and in a more timely, more timely way. This is not pre-crime technology that enables us somehow to stop crime before it happens, but it is an example of major a major technological project looking at whether we can use cutting-edge IT systems to work smarter at a time of streamlined resources. So just to turn briefly to gang crime. Gang crime is a priority for me as Commissioner and indeed, indeed a priority for Londoners. I arrived about three years ago and both statistically and by talking to people it was clear there was a gang problem. But neither London nor the Met had declared it. And the problem with not declaring problems is that we don't create a priority for resourcing or make sure that we have plans to deal with it. So we did say that we're going to do something about it. We have, we believe, at least 224 gangs in London and approximately 3,400 gang nominals, a relatively small number in a city of about 8.5 million. However, around half of the shootings, a quarter of the robberies, and a fifth of the stabbings are gang-related. So this very small number of people is having a hugely disproportionate effect on the 8.5 million. And it seems to me that by targeting them, we will target repeat offenders. And we have to do two things with equal ruthlessness, which all the research shows works. First of all, is to ruthlessly target them with enforcement. If they're going to hurt people, they will be locked up and they will have to go through the criminal justice system. It has to stop. But these gangs generally are sometimes at the age of 14, leading up to about 24. And if there's anything that we can do to stop them getting involved in a life of crime, then we should do it, both to save their lives and often the lives of other people. So my belief is that we need to target with equal ruthlessness the diversion. That is more of a challenge. It is not as clear as we're saying over breakfast exactly what works in terms of diversion. There's more of a debate. And getting consistent partners across a city the size of London to apply the same type of rigorous, consistent model is quite difficult. But it is something that we're embarked on and I think we're making some progress in. The gang command that we have has 1,200 officers, which is bigger than many police forces in this country and operates over 19 of the 32 boroughs. It may operate over 32, but I can't afford the resources, so we have to target where we're having more effect, can have most effect. It is a massive commitment for the Met, and is something that I think will, is already bringing us great benefits. Because we know that over the last three years, compared to the previous three years, our murder rate has dropped by 25%, including a third less young people murdered. Our shootings have halved, and the number of stabbings has dropped by a third. I cannot claim it's entirely down to this gang, gang work. I wouldn't claim that over much. But it must have had an impact when you see the disproportionate impact this group are having on the City of London. So I think there is something there. But I think if it's only enforcement, it will be a short-term win. We'll keep going back to the same people time and time again. And there is a profound need to do something else in the lives of these young people to make sure that they do not commit committing offences in the proportion that they, uh, they have been in the past. So what we're doing as well is to work alongside Professor David Kennedy, as you will know, an acclaimed criminologist, 
to see what more we can do with the resources we have and those of the local authority and try and use him and his, his learning as a catalyst for getting people to agree a common way forward. Uh, he's working now in five, will be working in five of our boroughs uh, in the coming years to implement some of the things that he learned in Boston. And we've tried to do that ourselves, but I have to say we've had limited success. And we think that David working in the way that he can would be a profound uh, influencer, one in sharing evidence and then being seen as a, I hope, a neutral and a, you know, an independent person who has no skin in the game in terms of the final outcome of them wanting to see society get better, but is deeply uh, persuasive about some of the things he's found and some of the things that work. That work will be funded by the uh, Mayor's Office uh, for Policing and Crime, and I think that his gang intervention model gives us a great opportunity for the future. And it's based on research and it's something that we know can work uh, in various uh, communities across the world. What I've talked about doesn't really do great justice to his work, but I think by having him, having him <coughs> alongside us, we will have that great benefit of an expert working at pace with practitioners. It goes live early next year, and we'll see the first gang call-ins then, uh, some of which we're doing, but I don't think we're doing it anywhere near the model that David first proposed. But basically, a cease and desist message is given, and supported exit from gang life is offered. So the things we've started, I think we can get more consistent, and we need another kickstart into what I think is a good investment, but it's not yet ready to put, repay uh, uh, in the coming years uh, all, the, um, all the work that will need to be done, because this is not a very quick fix problem. It's going to be a long-term solution, which we'll have to keep investing in year after year. Really, essentially, this is about a credible law enforcement mes message coupled with that offer of help if people should need it. And at the same time, we're improving our gang uh, nominals matrix. And this is a data set that tells us who are our most high-risk gang nominals and informs operational action by ensuring we share information as fully and effective as we can with partners in prison, probation, education, and health. And that is not always as straightforward as it may appear. So it's some of the lessons we've learned over the last couple of years is we've got to go back to the original idea and make sure that we evolve it and don't grow complacent with our first start. I'm going to mention another operation that we've, uh, we have in London, though I started in Merseyside. We've now seized under our Operation Q-Bill uh, over 100,000 vehicles that uh, are, were uninsured vehicles uh, in London, which is a massive number of vehicles. And the reason we seize them is for the simple rubric. That first of all, we know that 70% of the people who drive uninsured vehicles are criminals. And that group of people are five times more likely to have a collision. And if they have a collision, they're nine times more likely to have a serious collision where a serious injury follows. So these are a really interesting group of people. And what we found is that by seizing that number of vehicles, we inhibit criminal behaviour and we improve safety on the roads. We have the nice benefit that we can sell the cars if they don't insure them, and we can crush them if we can't sell them, and then we sell the scrap. And that's given us a few million pounds over the year. But we don't do it for the money. <clears throat> we do it because it inhibits the travel of criminals and it shows the public that we're doing something. And it's a tactic that's working right across London has also led to uh, decreased uh, insurance premiums for all of the people of London, because of course all of us are subsidised the people who have no insurance. But this is not just an attack on people who drive cars, this is an attack on people who commit crime. So the principle that we are establishing is that frequent offenders group together in uninsured cars, and that then our target is to make sure that we go out for officers every day to do it, but then twice a month, twice in 28 day period, the whole of the Met goes out and looks for insured cars. We sometimes use ANPR vehicles, we sometimes use intuition, it doesn't really matter. We just find the vehicles which are uninsured. It's one of the best indicators where, say, criminals wander around the street. So we found that, in fact, this works and that uh, makes a real difference in terms of general crime. But I mention it as a thought of a simple tactic that attacks repeat offenders who gather together in repeat locations called a vehicle. We've done an awful lot of work around stop and search. It's a real challenge around the world, stop and search. You're not just in the capitals of the great uh, countries. But right across the, uh, the world, we find that stop and search is a tactic that can damage community relations, often with minorities. And you see the same issues in New York, you see in, uh, over in the Far East. It's a, it's a real challenge for the police to get this right. And in 2012, I decided to change this focus of stop search and to make it more intelligence-led and effective, targeting its use towards those crimes that really mattered to Londoners and emphasising the need for respect and communication. What I discovered, though I'm not sure anybody has realised, is that in 2011, prior to the riots and in the preceding year, the Met had stopped or stopped and encountered nearly 1.3 million people in each year. 
Well, bear in mind at the time that there was only about 8.3 million people in London. This was a huge number. And they were the ones that were recorded. Now, of course, they didn't stop one person once. Some people were stopped multiple times. And what worried me, I can't say this caused the riots. We never had a public inquiry to properly establish what did may have been an aggravating factor for the riots. But both statistically, that's a very big number. And by talking to families who were, were angry about their kids being stopped, who had never committed a crime and probably never would, they didn't mind it once. They could live with twice in a month. But four times in a week, what was that about? And so for me, it had to change. Uh, the numbers were massive. It appeared discriminatory and it appeared indiscriminate. So for me, those were big reasons why we had to do something different. And I have to tell you at the time, it was quite risky. Because of course it is perceived that stop and search stops people stabbing each other or shooting each other. And if I'd stood here now, and in fact the statistics I mentioned earlier had gone the wrong way, more people have died, more people have been stabbed, I, I guarantee that people said the causal factor was less stop search. Um, but I knew that we had to do something different to maintain the support of the people of London. So over the last uh, two years, since we did all the work to get the training ready and make sure we got it right, uh, we voluntarily reduced the use of the Section 60 stop search power. That's the power that gives a blanket power with no grounds in an area declared by a police officer. And they'd grown a little like confetti around London. They'd followed years where we had a SUS law, years where we had a Section 44, the counter-terrorism law, which provided us random stop search right across London, and they were succeeded by Section 60. And uh, we've now reduced those Section 60 stop searches by 92%. This is a profound difference in terms of the way that we police. And actually, ironically, we can now police the number of Section 60s we have, whereas we couldn't in the past. There's no way you can retain in your mind where these, these areas are, nor the number of people you should be stopping in them. So that's made a real difference. We've also seen a real difference in the overall number of Section 1 stop searches, so that over the last two years, we've reduced the number of stop searches by 40%. This is a very significant number. We've decreased, or we've increased the arrest rate from the stop searches from below 10% to nearly 20%, and we've halved the number of complaints. Because first of all, we did an awful lot to target the stop search in the right place, and then secondly, we did an awful lot of work, and there is more to do about the officer's interaction with a member of the public, to make it a respectful interaction and not one that causes problems rather than prevents them. So that seems to be paying us some dividends. I still suspect there is more to do. We could probably still do less stop search and be more effective. And as New York has found, if you get this wrong, you lose the power. And that was a fear I had too. Not only the public reaction, but the potential for the legislature, legislature to say that, in fact, the stop search power is so indiscriminate, it causes more damage, why bother doing it? Stop it. Um, I think it's a useful power used wisely. Uh, and as we found in New York, uh, two things have happened there. First of all, there is a, a change of statute which says that sorry, a change of ordinance in the city, which says that a police officer incorrectly carrying out stop search will be personally liable for those actions. And secondly, they've imposed a commissioner on the police to say you can only use this power in certain circumstances. And they've gone from 750,000 stop searches in a year to 23,000. Now, I got that from Bill Bratton as he took a post, and I rang him to uh, congratulate him. So for me, they've gone off a cliff edge. This is what Bill inherited, not what he caused. But for me, we've gone down the slope. And I think we've retained the power, retained the respect, and we're building, I think, a better model than actually what could have happened had we continued in the way that we were. I think in terms of professionalism, there's far more that we, uh, we need to do in terms of how we uh, work with the new College of Policing, how they uh, uh, get new standards. We also need to improve the governance of the Met. We're going to have two non-executive directors on the board of the Met to help us to improve the way we do things and to learn good practice across public sector and commercial sector. We're working with Dame Shirley Pierce from the College of Policing to establish a new ethical framework for policing, um, which uh, will take an awful lot of work. And the thousand officers, a thousand leads, as I said, we got together last week, uh, and some more this week. It is a conversation exactly about ethics, not to make it a dry subject, but a real one involving industrial actors in ways that challenges people about dilemmas and how they will respond to them. I proposed, and we are going to have, if we can get a university to agree, but a professor of policing. Uh, because I think policing is important enough to have a department in our universities which teaches it, which researches it, which produces a profound body of knowledge. And I think it's a disgrace myself that we have quarter of a million police officers and staff in this country policing 60 million people, and yet there is not a department of university that thinks it's important enough to study. Of course we pick and mix from criminology, we pick and mix from sociology, we pick and mix from forensic science. <clears throat> but we have things that we need to, to know. 
we have things that we need to build up as a body of knowledge so that we can train leaders, we can train our staff. And at the moment, I don't think we have enough. I was saying earlier to people that we were looking recently, when I was in the inspectorate with, with Dennis, we were looking for some work on serial rape, and we couldn't find it. We could find look quite a lot on serial murder. These are two of the rarest, but, you know, most interesting topics for research. And yet there's so much more that we could have research on. So who's doing it? And why don't they want to work in this great laboratory in our case, which is the Met, or policing in general, and come up to their PhDs, their DPhils with us, and teach us lessons, but also prepare profound truths. So for me, it's something I feel passionately about, uh, and should be delivered in the next 12 months in terms of getting our funding model. Then we'll ask universities to apply for that. And we'll have a mix of uh, Met funding, uh, public funding, uh, and individuals who are prepared to put their own hands in the pocket. And I'm prepared to do that too, because I think it's something that uh, should be invested in for the future, although I probably can't invest at the same level as some multimillionaires. But it's worth an investment. It's worth something that people put uh, some money into. Um, we think that in terms of improving professionalism, gross misconduct hearings should be carried out in public. Um, and the Met will work the Home Office, IPCC and College of Policing to change mis police misconduct regs. We want gross misconduct hearings to be held all in public, unless there are compelling reasons why that can't happen and a presumption that misconduct findings will be published along with the, rush, the panel's rationale. I'm only going to talk now about just a couple of areas in closing about some of the operational research that we've carried out and some of the things that we're trying to do to improve the way we police. One of the challenges that the police and the rest of the system has is about how we deal with sexual offences in general and uh, rape in particular. We know already that 80% of people who are victims of sexual offences do not come forward. We know those who come forward, 80%, 85% of the people who are victims will be vulnerable in one way or another. They may be psychiatrically ill, they may be affected by drugs, they may be affected by drink. And I think this is causing some real challenges in the system. It affects juries, and the knock on water fall down the system is that it may be affecting investigators, prosecutors, and I would argue even the health service. In May of 2014, the Met held its first rape scrutiny panel. Uh, this is an innovative idea that responds to national public concerns around the integrity of police recording of sexual offences. This is chaired by one of our commanders in specialist crime and includes two independent academics. The panel reviews those rape reports that met crime integrity process have authorised as being a no crime, so that this crime never happened. Even though there was a report, the crime is withdrawn. It invites external scrutiny into some of our most sensitive and controversial crime recording decisions. On this occasion, uh, the panel upheld two reports in a five-month period being regarded as no crime. And that's a massive change from what previously had been well over 100 where it had been no crime. So that external scrutiny seems to improve the way, I think, that we are doing this. The panel sits again in six months' time to check our decision-making. We're also having an external commission carried out by Dame Eilish Angiolini, QC, to review police and prosecutorial responses to rape and sexual offences, and it's to look at a whole system from the report, either through the health system or the criminal justice system, how we care for that victim and how we get it through to a court. It's really building on an approach that we had about 18 months ago now, uh, led by Lord Adebowale, who I, asked, I commissioned to carry out a piece of work about how the police deal with psychiatric illness. And what he told us is something perhaps we should have known, which is that 40% of the people we come into contact with have got a psychiatric issue. And it's not a marginal activity, it's front and centre. And the recommendations that he produced had a profound effect on the Met, but also had a profound effect on the system, including the Health Service, Crown Prosecution Service, and many others, in a way that I think if I had produced a report, it never would. So we think that by involving an independent, able person, looking at a whole system approach, it really has produced profound ideas and recommendations which have an effect uh, in the middle term. So that's why we've asked Dame Ehrlich to have a look at this and she'll report in a further six months' time. So in two areas in which we've seen great challenges, psychiatric illness and sexual offences, we're getting external help to provide ideas, not only for the police, but how the whole system think about, thinks about these very challenging areas of policing and just generally in society. The only other area that I really wanted to talk about now was cybercrime. Cybercrime, without going into any great detail, as you know, is a challenge. Um, but I think I got fed up about a year ago of coming to seminars like this and hearing more and more people describe a problem to which nobody was doing anything. And yet we know that many companies and many countries are investing an awful lot in protecting themselves against cybercriminals. 
Tens of millions of dollars and pounds have been invested by companies 24 hours a day, stopping often states and sometimes individuals getting to their systems. And yet, what are we collectively doing to do something about this? So for me, the police have got to do more. And what's happening at the moment is that some of these complex investigations are landing on the desk of a detective sergeant in Croydon with not a cat in hell's chance of doing anything about it. Sometimes with hundreds of victims accumulating a day, millions of pounds being stolen with an offender abroad, and victims scattered, if you're lucky, around the United Kingdom. So we have to have a different approach to this. It's cross-jurisdictional, it's complex to investigate and prove, uh, and of course, it's complex to stop. But it's entirely possible to do this if we work our way through it. So during this year, we're accumulating 500 officers and staff who will be our new cyber crime unit, a very significant investment for the Met. People keep saying to me, well, why 500? I don't know. But I do know it's a lot of people. <laughs> and someone has to put the foot in the sand and do something instead of just watching the problem go past. What I am sure is that that 500 people with proper investment will learn lessons that we haven't got a clue about today. They will learn new ways of investigating, new ways of working with partners, and I hope we'll get investments from others. It may be academics, it may be business, it may be the state, but with that investment there is something to group around, and at the moment there is nothing to group around, and that cannot be good enough for public, business or state. So for me, we will learn new lessons in the future, but as an example of something we're doing to try and improve the way that we police in an area of policing that's constantly changing uh, as we look at it. There's not an awful lot else I, uh, I really wanted to talk about, uh, other than to say that I'd like to return to my original thesis, is that you know the, the Met is changing at pace, London is changing at pace, which means that we need to have new ideas and new ways of doing things. I've tried to sketch out some of the challenges, <coughs> excuse me, and also some of our responses. I'm not going to stand here and say they've all been evaluated. I'm not going to stand here and say that, in fact, there is a double-blind testing of everything that we've done. But I think there could be in the future, and it's entirely possible to test some of these ideas. But of course, as a pragmatist and operational person, we don't often have the luxury of reflection. We sometimes have to do and then to assess, when sometimes it can be better to do the reflection first and then to plan and then to deliver. But our great challenge in receiving 5 million telephone calls a year is to do something, and that's our strength. We have 50,000 people who will turn around and do something. But at times we need more reflection. At times we need more challenge. I'm perfectly willing to understand and accept that. So I've sketched out some of the challenges, some of our immediate responses, and some of our big investments. But I hope you'll accept there's far more to do in terms of making sure that what we do is tested, what we do is more rigorously analysed, and we will need help in evolving some of the ideas which I think have got credence and will stand the test of time. Uh, we always need the test of research and evaluation, which I hope this audience may consider uh, as they're reflecting on some of the other things they will hear in the various speeches. And if anybody's of any interest in working with us on any of the ideas I've sketched out, there's probably another 10 that I omitted to talk about. Uh, very happy to work in what is our great laboratory of London and the Met. But thanks for taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.